Hello and welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point. I'm Li Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to make up for the missing, some deliberately pieces of the puzzle. So join me in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Weibo or WeChat. We live stream Headline Buster at 11 a.m. Beijing time on Thursdays and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Friday. So do join me during the live streaming and get in touch. We would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments. Selfishness can be such a radioactive topic. Imagine a country, especially one that has received your help during times of nuclear disaster, tells you unashamedly, and that's the irony of it all, that is going to release radioactive water in the ocean, which you share too, willy-nilly, like it or not. Right, the topic today is about the release of so-called treated water from the damaged nuclear power plants in Fukushima, Japan. Now let's rewind a bit. On March the 11th, 2011, a devastating 9.1 magnitude earthquake wreaked havoc on three nuclear reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. A massive amount of water has been used to cool the damaged reactors. Now, 12 years on, what to do with the over 1 million tons of contaminated water before it reaches storage limit? In April two years ago, Japan announced it will release the water into the Pacific Ocean after treatment, citing leakage risks and a lack of storage space. The owner of the plants, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, said that an approach called Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, could extract most radioactive elements from the water but it admits more than 70% of the treated water would need additional treatment to meet regulatory standards for release. As for the isotopes called uh, tritium and carbon-14, which are difficult to separate from water, Japan's plan is add 100 times seawater to dilute it. Does the plan have scientific merits? Well, scientists are divided on the issue. Some argue that this is a standard practice around the world, the environmental and health risks are minimal, and that the plan is feasible in reducing the risks. Others have warned against its reliability and durability. Robert Richmond, director of the Kewalo Marine Laboratory at the University of Hawaii, called it a transboundary and transgenerational event. The United States-based National Association of Marine Laboratories, an organization with more than 100 member labs in the U.S. or U.S. territories, released a statement last December opposing the plan, citing a lack of adequate and accurate scientific data supporting Japan's assertion of safety. In a nutshell, the debate is still on, and Japan has yet to produce solid scientific proofs to convince the international community that it's safe to discharge the treated water. Naturally, the plan has caused waves of objections at home and abroad. Hiroshi Kishi, president of JF Zengyorin, a Japanese national fisheries organization, said in 2020, even before the plan was officially announced, we are dead against a release of contaminated water to the ocean as it could have a catastrophic impact on the future of Japan's fishing industry. The Japanese capital and the Fukushima region have witnessed countless public protests against the decision. Currently, some 40% of Japanese people, according to surveys, are still against the plan, almost as high as the percentage of those backing it. Japan's Pacific Rim neighbors have been vocal in their objections. Immediately after the plan was announced, China demanded Japan not to go ahead before reaching a consensus with all stakeholders. Two years on, Japan has struggled to win hearts and minds on the issue, even among its G7 allies. Germany's Environment Minister Steffi Lemke said during a G7 Environment meeting in April that I respect the efforts made by TEPCO and the Japanese government after the nuclear accident, but we cannot welcome the release of the treated water.
in the Republic of Korea, over 80% of people are opposed to the discharge, as per a poll published in May, jointly conducted by Japanese and ROK newspapers. The official position of the country, however, has appeared to have changed from one of strong concern to one of acceptance with the change of government. The opposition has criticized the current administration for prioritizing relations with Japan over the health of its people and the environment. Meanwhile, a team of South Korean nuclear safety experts who visited the wrecked power plant in May said further analysis was needed to determine whether the processed water would be safe and whether the system would work long term. In January this year, 18 Pacific Island countries, which are no stranger to nuclear contamination given the U.S. history of using their territory as nuclear arms testing grounds, issued an op-ed on a premier regional policy forum titled, Japan must work with the Pacific to find a solution to the Fukushima water release issue. Otherwise, we face disaster. On July the 4th, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the International Nuclear Watchdog, released a final report on the safety of the treated water, claiming that the approach and activities to the discharge of the Alps treated water taken by Japan are, quote unquote, consistent with relevant international safety standards. But how authoritative is this report? which came out two years after Japan announced the decision. We will discuss that later in this program. China's foreign ministry said the IAEA report should not be a shield or green light for the decision and continue to call for its suspension. China says if Japan insists on going ahead with the plan, it will have to bear all the consequences. China urges the Japanese side to work with the IAEA to put in place, as soon as possible, a long-term international monitoring me mechanism that would involve share stakeholders, including Japan's neighboring countries. So, make a decision and then have it endorsed by the United Nations and shove it down the throats of others. Is that the right way to handle a matter involving radioactivity? But how have the media covered the story so far? Let's take a closer look. Surprise, surprise, China instead of Japan seems to come under the spotlight. I'm being cynical here, of course. Here is how one American media reported Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbing's statement on May 10th. It is extremely irresponsible of Japan to selfishly put the world at risk, one said. But his remarks were labeled false. In one episode of VOA's fact check video titled, China Unfairly Slams Japan's Plan to Release Fukushima Wastewater in the Pacific. What are their arguments? According to the IAEA, tritium may present a radiation hazard if inhaled or ingested, but is only harmful to humans in very large doses. In addition, the release of the Fukushima wastewater will take up to 30 years. Compared with the radioactivity already present in the Pacific, the planned annual release is a literal drop in the ocean. Three Australian scientists wrote accessing Japan's plan. But, as I said, these Australian experts, however numerous they may be, do not represent the whole scientific community. As I mentioned earlier, there are many others who are against the idea. As the statement of the National Association of Marine Laboratories points out, the effectiveness of the ELPS remains a serious concern due to the absence of critical data. Someone probably hit the nail in the head in the comment section. The comment goes, if China instead of Japan would release this uh, treated and safe, so-called safe, radioactive water as they have gone through a chain of advanced filters, I wonder if VOA would fact-check the critics, and I'm sure there will be plenty. That sounds true to me. What is transparency for Japan would have been opacity for China. There would have been international outcry for sure. But hey, Japan is one of us, so let's go soft. Now, it's no secret that China and Japan have uh, had a not so rosy relationship, uh, to put it mildly. So China is always on the lookout for blaming Japan. That's the uber simplistic narrative we get from some media.
This piece from AP says just that, however. China, which Japan invaded in the first half of last century, has been a constant critic of Tokyo and its security alliance with the United States, with the ruling Communist Party frequently invoking historical wrongs to rally domestic support and seeking to undermine Japan's global standing makes it look like China has embarked on a crusade against Japan regardless of the topic or the evidences. Well, many other countries in the region are also seriously concerned about the release too. Are they also on a crusade against Japan? And when the same AP looks at South Korea's reaction, we hear a different narrative. The title of that story reads, South Korean experts say Japan carefully answered questions on a plan to release radioactive water. Let me remind you, Korea was ruled as part of the Empire of Japan from 1910 to 1945, and South Korea's relationship with Japan have long been strained until the current administration reached out. Why isn't the bloodstained history nowhere to be found in this article? No grudges here. South Korea is one of us, hence the different treatment. By contrast, the media interest towards other critics of Japan's decision seems to drop abruptly like the ocean floors. I'm referring to the Pacific Island countries, which suffered terribly from the nuclear testing and the detonation of 24 nuclear weapons by the U.S. between 1946 and 1958. Well, this article, published on Time, recounts the toxic history. But it seems to be the only mainstream Western outlet interested in their perspective. Their concern is not about history, but about what will happen in the future. The op-ed I mentioned earlier, released by 18 Pacific Island nations, urges Japan to store or dump its nuclear waste in its country instead of discharging it in the Pacific. Japan's plan, the statement says, is not merely a nuclear safety issue, it's rather a nuclear legacy issue, an ocean, fisheries, environment, biodiversity, climate change and health issue with the future of our children and children, their future generations at stake. The Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, a premier regional policy forum, made it very clear the Pacific Islands Forum remains fully committed to addressing strong concerns for the significance of the potential threat of nuclear contamination to the health and security of the Blue Pacific, its people and prospects. Now, I did a simple online search for Japan, nuclear wastewater, followed by China, South Korea, and Pacific Island countries separately. Intriguingly, the spotlight seems to shine primarily on China and South Korea, leaving the Pacific Island nations in the shadow. It feels as if the dialogue, especially after South Korea's shifting stance, has been spun into a geopolitical skirmish between China and Japan. Finally, Credit where credit's due. The National Geographic magazine took on the daring task of shedding light on the situation. In a gripping expose, we hear from both sides, the Japanese government's reassurance and the scientists' doubts. The concluding quote from the scientists is a chilling reminder of the uncertainties that lie ahead. Trust us, we'll take care of it, TEPCO claimed confidently. As we continue to hear diverging views on the issue, one thing we mustn't overlook. The oceans are the shared inheritance of all humankind. The way we manage the wastewater from Fukushima nuclear power plant isn't Japan's burden alone. Its handling will echo far beyond its borders, rippling into the global community and into the future. But when politics is involved, can the voice of reason prevail. We'll talk with our guests from all over the world for more details right after the break. And our guests include Professor Chi Ye from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Lake Barrett, former U.S. Energy Department of Energy official who is now senior advisor to the TEPCO, Arjun Makijani, president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, and Duncan Curry, an international law expert. Stay with us. Japanese seafood may be popular in Hong Kong, but options may soon be limited. The government warns that it will immediately ban imported aquatic products from Fukushima and nearby coastal prefectures deemed high risk. Some lower risk prefectures could also face restrictions. That's if Japan goes ahead with plans to dump over 1 million metric tons of wastewater from the stricken Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the sea. 
Starting sometime this summer and over the next 30 years, Japan will release the treated wastewater which it says is safe. But global concerns have intensified after a fish recently caught near the power plant reportedly contained a radioactive element cesium with levels exceeding Japanese food safety standards by 180 times. I have reflected our concerns to the Japan authorities well, several times, as well as the Consulate General in Hong Kong. Although we are prepared to take whatever actions required, still, we sincerely we hope that well, Japan can find alternative way what to do with their sea wastewater, because discharging the wastewater into the sea, even with treatment, we think is highly risky. Again, it will pose a risk well, to damage marine ecology, food safety, and also the relationship with their nearby countries. Since the Fukushima incident in 2011, Hong Kong has already restricted food imports from five prefectures, including Fukushima and Chiba. Consumers can also look to labels to make more informed decisions. While labels on imported prepack food may indicate the country of origin, further details aren't required. But there are stores like this that are more transparent with their products from Japan. Now these are crab legs and I can see that it's from Japan and more specifically from Kanagawa Prefecture. Labels aside, the Hong Kong government has recently increased radiation testing on imported food from Japan and if the wastewater is released, it'll step up monitoring of radioactivity in local fishery products and Hong Kong waters. According to the Hong Kong Federation of Restaurants and Related Trades, about 15% of the city's seafood imports are from Japan. The Federation adds that some importers and restaurants in the city will be affected by the potential ban. But this seafood business, which mostly sells oysters, says it's not worried. From Japan, our imports are usually from Iwate, Miyagi, or Hokkaido Prefecture. We have products from many different countries, like Spain, France, South Africa, and Australia, so we can still find different suppliers from elsewhere. He adds that many Japanese oysters originate from nearby areas north of Fukushima, so if that area is banned, Totori or Hokkaido could be alternatives. And Cheng, CGTN, Hong Kong. You have been watching Headline Buster, a special segment on The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Beijing to critique, to look at uh, important media stories on sensitive issues. And today our topic is the planned release of so-called treated water that's contaminated with radioactivity from damaged nuclear power plants from Fukushima, Japan. Now my guests once again include Professor Chi Ye, who is from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He is also Professor of the School of Public Policy and Management with Tsinghua University. He is joining us from Guangzhou, Southern China. We have Lake Barrett joining us at 5 o'clock in the morning from Italy, Sorrento, who is former U.S. Department of Energy official, who is now senior advisor to Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO. Welcome to you. We have Dr. Arjun Maki Jani, who is president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, joining us at 11 in the evening from Maryland, the United States. We have, last but not least, Duncan Curry, an international law expert, who's joining us from Mauritius also early in the morning. Thank you very much much, gentlemen, for joining us. Um, Professor Chi, let me go with you first. Um, it seems that we have two issues here. One is about politicization of uh, scientific matters. The other is the pure scientific matter, whether or not uh, Japan's plan is reliable and durable. What exactly is China object or South Korea and the Pacific Island countries are objecting to? Uh, thank you, Lutien. Uh, I just uh, unmuted myself. Uh, you know, the uh, the Fukushima incident 12 years ago was such a tragedy. Uh, every tragedy of uh, such a scale, impact, and consequences is not just limited to one nation. It is uh, a tragedy of the entire human beings. And uh, actually, I think the world takes it so seriously and just because of that. And uh, this incident, now, I mean, this uh, uh, currently the release of the, the so-called treated water into the ocean and uh, is indeed a transnational, transboundary and transgenerational issue. And it will have a long-term impact on the ecosystems, on the ecology of the ocean, on the, uh, the human health. I mean, this is more than a scientific issue. It is an issue with ecological, social and economic dimensions. We all 
acknowledge that. And the issues like this, we must find a consensus. In order to find consensus, we need the, the, uh, the scientific research, we need to, to release the scientific data, we need to have a engaged debate. But so far, we do not see that yet. Indeed, we have CIEA re to release the report. I think that is just the, the beginning of it. And we should not take it as the last verdict. And we should take it very seriously and, uh, and to have a scientific debate and have a debate uh, among the people, among all the stakeholders, all the concerned citizens. That is what is lacking right now. I think the, the, the citizens in the world and government are concerned because we do not have this debate yet. We do not have an open, engaged discussion yet. And uh, so we must halt it right now and uh, do not release before we reach that consensus. All right, uh, Mr. Barrett, let me go to you. You are a senior advisor to the TEPCO. You must have been uh, here discussing this topic or hearing about it uh, reported for quite some time now. What is the TEPCO's um, narrative or version of the story um, you have tried to communicate with the international community how come uh, it seems that at least Japan's neighbors some of Japan's neighbors are not convinced that the plan is safe and durable well first of all it, the the Fukushima accident back in 2011 was a very serious matter and everyone takes that uh, uh, very seriously and we want to be do, reducing the risk for everyone involved in Japan and across the world so that work continues on from a scientific point of view what's needed here is to reduce the risk at site and we need to move forward and remove the melted fuel debris that's inside it's being contained inside but those systems are very old now and they're they're degrading so we need to move forward with the fueling and to do that we need to make room on the site to be able to remove that fuel the treated water has been treated uh and it needs to be scientifically evaluated it's been done that has happened for the last two years uh, it has been reviewed by the International Atomic en Energy Agency, as well as by many others. Uh, Korean de large Korean delegation uh, visited the site and reviewed the science that's going on there. The, the radioactivity that's in the treated water is minuscule. Uh, it meets all international safety and environmental standards. And in fact, it's only a tenth of the tritium that's released by the Chinese reactors every day. And let me say the Chinese, I think, have done an amazing job with their reactor fleet uh, there, is, there in China as well for a clean, affordable energy for the future. So, yes, it's a difficult thing for everyone. And uh, it's really gotten difficult, in my point of view, uh, from a geopolitical point of view where different countries have different uh, uh, relationships. And it's been a difficult past for 100 years. But we need to move forward with the science uh, as to the safety of it. And it is safe. Uh, and it is environmentally acceptable, and it is a small fraction of, of what's needed uh, uh, for, for protection in the future. Professor Makijani, um, we've heard uh, this uh, statement from the side of Japan and the TEPCO company. Uh, what is the viewpoint from uh, some of the um, scientists in this field and uh, from the Pacific Island nations, which you have been serving as an independent uh, expert for their recommendations? Right, thank you. I'm one of the five expert panel members. Uh, we've been looking at this pretty intensively for some time. Our first report to the Pacific Islands Forum was issued last August. I'd be happy to put the link in the chat. We found a host of problems with the science that TEPCO had done. We found they didn't have an accurate idea of what was in the tanks. We found they had no no accurate idea of how they were going to deal with the water in the tanks that have sludges. Would the sludges actually uh, gum up the treatment system? Would it actually work? What would happen if the water wasn't clean enough? Well, they said, we'll simply run it through again and again. How many times? Well, one of the IAEA representatives actually said, well, it could be 300 times. That is not a plan. So. So the scientific deficiencies in the environmental impact assessment are very serious. We have ecologists, ocean ecologists as part of our team. They are uh, 
you cannot arrive at an, a conclusion based on a seriously flawed environmental assessment that the harm will be negligible. In fact, the IAEA was so eager to say the harm will be quote, ne un quote unquote negligible that the IAEA in their meeting with us on the 8th and 9th of June, 9th of June in your part of the world, um, said that nature creates thousands of kilos of tritium every year, whereas the correct number is a few hundred grams a year. So, so eager were they to say the harm will be negligible that the amount of natural tritium was stated wrongly by 10,000 times. But that's not my biggest worry. My biggest worry is what the IAEA is doing and what is in its report. It has announced seven documents that says are fundamental to this evaluation. And it has thrown overboard essential parts of those documents. Safety principle number four says it must be justified, which means benefits must be more than the harm. Uh, guidance number eight says elaborates on that. And the IAEA says, we are not going to consider justification because we came into this after the decision to dump was already made. And dump is a technical term in the 1972 uh, Treaty on Prevention of the Marine Pollution. And that's what we should call this, dumping, because that is what it is. Oh. The IAEA, so let me say one more thing. Yeah. The IAEA said that Justification is Japan's responsibility. We're not going to look at it. What has Japan said? Japan, in a letter to the expert panel, said that we are not going to consider justification and benefits for every individual country. The Pacific Ocean is a society as a whole, and Japan is basically going to decide for that society as a whole. I think that's a pretty egregious statement. Because if Japan is going, if there's a decision to be made for the Pacific society as a whole, I think the people of that Pacific society should have a pretty big say mm. in that decision making, which has not been the case. All right. Um, I will have uh, the other guests to respond to what uh, Dr. Uh, Makijani just said. But uh, Mr. Curry, let me go to you first. You are more of an expert on the legal aspect and, of course, on the environmental aspect. What is your position uh, on this matter? And what do you think is the important messages that are not being heard now? Yeah, th thank you. There are two primary issues at, at stake here. Firstly, is the obligation not to pollute uh, areas beyond your jurisdiction and to ensure that the pollution within your jurisdiction does not spread beyond the area that, that the Japan exercises sovereign rights. In other words, a very clear, very long-standing obligation not to allow pollution to escape from your own country to the high seas or to the waters of another country. Quite honestly, there's absolutely no doubt this obligation will be breached here. There's also a general overarching obligation under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which says states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment, again, not being implemented here. And then the second big concern, and Professor Upsonjani's uh, talked about this, is the lack of an envir environmental impact assessment. International law is, again, very clear. When states have reasonable grounds for believing that activities may cause substantial pollution of or significant and harmful changes to the marine environment, they shall assess the potential effect of these activities by conducting an environmental impact assessment. What we have seen is not an environmental impact assessment. It, it does not, for example, look at cumulative impacts. It only looks at three species in, in, in the water. It doesn't, it doesn't, for example, look at mussels which bioaccumulate. Um, it, it hasn't, Japan hasn't carried out full consultations with neighbours, and uh, there are alternatives, we haven't touched on that, but for example, um, the tritium, which is the, um, is the radioactive isotope which we've talked about here, mm -hmm. um, only has a relatively short half-life, so if it was left in storage for another 12 years, that would improve the safety. Um, Japan could, or TEPCO, could acquire more land and build more um, build more tax. So there are alternatives here that haven't been discussed. 
And lastly, there are steps that countries can take. China, Korea, concerned Pacific Island states can go to an international court called the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is based in Hamburg. They could obtain a, an order called, um, essentially it's like an, an injunction, um, and they could get an order, for example, requiring that Japan um, consults with its neighbours, um, does not cause serious harm to the marine environment, and so on. So international law does provide a way forward. The last thing I would say is that the world has just finished negotiating a treaty on, on marine biodiversity called right. BBNJ for short. And that treaty has very specific provisions on how to conduct an environmental impact assessment, including the things I just talked about, consultation, public participation, cumulative impact, things that we haven't seen carried out here. And it also underlines mm. the concern that the entire global community has about the uh, protection and, um, and preservation of mm. marine biodiversity. Okay. Thank well. You. Thank you. Well, let me get back to our American guest, Mr. Barrett. I know you are the minority here. That's why you're particularly appreciated for your being with us and, you know, have the courage to answer all of these tough questions. Uh, what are some of the points you want to address, uh, as has have been mentioned by our other guests, for instance, the fact that there is not a environmental impact assessment that's been carried out by TEPCO on this issue. The IAEA is more or less a nuclear safety watchdog, whereas environment and biodiversity is much, uh, is a different topic. Hmm. Mr. Barrett, we don't hear you. Yeah. There have been extensive environmental right. analysis. Would you, would, you, would you start again because we don't want to miss out the beginning of your sentence, please. Sure. There have been extensive environmental analyses done for the last 12 years uh, about the Pacific Ocean. First of all, everybody cares very much about the Pacific Ocean and maintaining this environmental strength and, and the diversity that's there. And Japan would like to have friends with everyone, but there is a long history and we have to, the, the world has to deal with that. But from a science point of view, the radioactivity in, in this tritiated water is minuscule. It's the same as what's released in, every, in a controlled manner from every reactor across the world. Um, and, and there are many uh, misleading statements given to scare people um, and make them uh, upset about it. Uh, and it's sad to see in the geopolitical arena that going on uh, dealing with issues for the last hundred years. There have been environmental studies about everything uh, in, in, the, in this water release. It's been processed many times. Uh, it's very open and transparent. It's very technical uh, information that's been given, and sometimes it's not given in the most effective manner for the common person to understand. But precautions have been taken. Uh, they've been reviewed by over 50 experts in the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, uh, including representatives from China and from South Korea and, and Pacific Islands as well. So there has been a lot of uh, information exchange, uh, but there's always some people who don't agree with it. There are some people who are anti-nuclear and well, don't want to... Yeah. Mr. Barrett, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, put the geopolit geopolitics aside. As I mentioned, the, Na the Association of uh, National Labor the National Association of Marine Laboratories, which group, which is a group of a hundred uh, laboratories in the United States or on U.S. territories, they are objecting to the plan. I don't think geopolitics is there. They're saying there is a critical, there is a lack of accurate and critical data to assess the impact of the plan. What do you? How do you respond to that? I responded by saying oh, that data is now available. It is on the TEPCO website. People can go and see it. Yes, five, six years ago, there, there was uh, information was not provided as much but, as it should have But they have been. released the statement, no. Mr. Barrett. They released the statement only last December. It was not right. I'm, I'm, Yeah. I'm much familiar that. with that process uh, by which that statement came to be. Uh, they did look at the regulatory environmental impact statement. I'm not just, I'm one of the scientists that has reviewed this, so it's not easy to mislead me or with numbers. You know that, Mr. Barrett. We've known each other for a long time, right? Uh, so uh, I'm a numbers person. I take my numbers extremely seriously. I have lived by my numbers for more than half a century. 
And this regulatory environmental impact statement is seriously flawed, and the IAEA has endorsed a plan based on a seriously flawed environmental impact statement. I'm not panicking anybody. I'm just saying you can't make a scientifically sound statement on safety on a scientifically flawed environmental impact statement. I'll give you an example. Yes, please. So uh, a, a recent uh, peer-reviewed uh, paper on tritium impact on carp showed that 500 becquerels per liter, which is one-third the level proposed to be discharged after dilution, 500 becquerels per liter would increase the rate of damaged eggs and dead eggs in carp relative to control water. Now, control water doesn't have zero tritium. It has some tritium in it, so it's also polluted. But this is 500 is more. And as you increase that to 5,000, the damage increases significantly, statistically. We, we presented this to Japan. The most important thing I'd like to say is the expert panel uh, over uh, about a year ago suggested that the water could be cleaned and put into concrete. The concrete will stop, stop the tritium in beta. You know that, Mr. Barrett, right? Uh, beta, beta rays from tritium are very weak, so they will be stopped by concrete. Even if the concrete becomes rubble, the tritium beta particles will not get out. So this, this should be evaluated. It was not evaluated when we first brought it up. TEPCO falsely said or misleadingly at least said, we've evaluated it when they had evaluated something completely different. Now, why are... Concrete would make room faster. I think you should persuade your client to look yeah. at it, like, like oh. Barrett. I'd, I'd be okay. happy to work with you on that. Okay, Dr. Makijani, um, again... Uh, Mr. Barry, you're, not, you're nodding your head, but this is a pressing question that a lot of people have been asking. Has Japan exhausted all the available options or explored all possible options in disposing the water? For instance, using it for irrigation if it is safe or putting it into concrete, as Mr. Makijani just said. Why not trying these options? Because that will limit the impact the environmental impact to Japan's territory instead of spreading it potentially to other parts of the world? The Japanese government five years ago had an extensive multi-year evaluation of the various options. They looked at building additional tanks. They looked at evaporating the water. They looked at you know other matters like that. So they evaluated these for over two years in a public manner. Public reports exist out there. Uh, and they looked at it. There is, a, there is no room at the site. It is a very tight site. Uh, it is salty water, so you can't necessarily put it on irrigation, as Dr. Markahani said. So there are many. I didn't many say that. Well, you just said you could. Well, you didn't I didn't say it. irrigation. He said put well, it in I concrete. Said. I said irrigation. You could, okay. you could put it in. You could put it in concrete. Okay, you could, but there's no room, and the and it's stopping the risk reduction of moving forward to remove the radioactive fuel that's melted inside that plant. That is the largest risk. And that's what needs to be pursued to reduce the risk for everyone in the Pacific region. Um, and this is, as I said, it's a tenth of the radioactivity is released every day from the Chinese reactors in America as well. So it is not an environmental uh, disaster that people use those words mm. all the time. Okay, Professor Chi, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I think. Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Barrett, I think it is a not. It's not. It's not quite appropriate to compare. The, the emission, uh, I mean, the release of this uh, uh, treated water to the uh, uh, emission of Chinese and American facilities, because we, we are, they, these are very different in nature. And, and you talked about this uh, understanding of the, the, the statement or, or your EIA stuff. You know, I'm also a numbers person. Uh, and I, uh, I used to teach at UC Berkeley in Cornell. I used to work at the Scripps Institution of oceanography, we look at the numbers very seriously. I think it is a very good first step to release these reports and then make these reports to uh, available to the public, to the scientific community. Let's have an engage a discussion on this. And uh, they, you, you cannot just say, you know, these are final, right? These are final uh, conclusions and these are absolutely correct. 
Let's talk about this, you know, like, like this kind of conversation. Why such a rush to release the water? And I also, I think that the, the, the space it should not be a problem. We're talking about one, one, one million, right? One million tons. Well, what's that? That is the very limited space. And uh, like, I think the, the fundamental approach should be to a containment of whatever pollution, you know, the, uh, the, the radioactive pollution is, uh, is especially important. The containment, not to release, not to make a transboundary to, to other places, like Mr. Curry just said, right? You're not, you're not allowed, you're, you're, you're not, uh, you should not to make that pollu the pollution beyond your own jurisdiction. And that's the very basic, the, the, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we, we need to think about a very different approach. The current approach is absolutely not right. It's not moving in the right direction. So let, let's stop it. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's make it sound more frankly sound uh, discussion on this before we take this so tra so such a, a tragic uh, okay. uh, the, the actions. Right? Yeah. Mr. Curry, uh, from your perspective, uh, what's the stalemate and the way out of it? And, oh, and, and, what, <laughs> and what would be even greater consequence if Japan really goes ahead despite the objections and mm. the controversies? Yes, thank you. I think Professor Chi put his finger on it when he, he, he talked about the need for consultation and discussion because when um, Mr. Barrett, for example, talked about the need to re reduce risk, Japan is reducing risk at the expense of its neighbours and at the expense of the international community and the Pacific Island countries. That's the nub of the problem. The fishermen are going to, or fisher folk are going to, to suffer from this. Um, people will not buy fish which is contaminated or believed to be contaminated by Fukushima. So you'll, you, you'll see a lot of people suffering very real economic consequences as well as, well as concern and, and as well as damage to the marine environment. And this is the reason that, that international coordination and consultation is absolutely critical. It's an obligation yeah. under international law. Yeah. So um, th that's the way to address this, is mm -hmm. to reach out and try to find a solution which does not pass the risk okay. on to the environment or to other countries. Mr. Curry, let me interrupt you here because we have a comment from a viewer who says, by this Anton Zhang, who says, who asks, will the U.S. impose sanctions for a thing like this? Well, I know this is a probably, you know, a, a cynical statement or, you know, asking a question out of cynicism, but in real uh, situ real life situation, Mr. Curry, um, can the other countries just sit and watch, even if they are objecting to the the plan of the of, of Japan on a matter that concerns them? Obviously, uh, is there any international mechanism in place or tools that the neighboring countries or Pacific Island countries can take in order to have their say and have their interests protected? Yes, there is. They can take a case to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg and request provisional measures. That hearing would be take place very quickly, um, a matter of months. We, we've seen this before. There was another nuclear case um, in, in 2003 when, again, there was a very short um, time elapsed between the filing of the case. What if and Japan North objects to that? What if Japan says, I'm not going? Unfortunately for Japan, Japan is a member of the international community. They're a party to the Law of the Sea Convention, and there are 20 judges sitting there in Hamburg waiting to hear the case. It, it is already paid for by the public purse. Japan would have no alternative. They could, they could fail to show up, but the result of that would be an order against Japan. Oh, wow. um, it, it, so it, it, there are legal tools okay. that can be, be, can be taken. Mm. Thank you. Well, time is very limited. I'm going to give each and every one of you an opportunity to speak very briefly, 10, 10 15 seconds, if you will, about the way out of this. You know, despite the geopolitics, uh, there are real impact, real stakes, real interests at stakes so for the people in the region. So, um, Professor Chi, you want to start? Uh, do not release the, the water uh, right now. Let's have a consultation. Let's have a, a serious discussion on this. Okay, Mr. Barrett? It, it's important in the international community to discuss things. I agree with that. Uh, but the water is safe and it needs to be released to go forward to reduce the risk for everybody in this globe. Dr. Makijani, please. The Nuclear Regulatory Authority in uh, Japan should cancel its authorization 
and the concrete option should be considered. Uh, safe storage and seismically safe tanks after cleaning the water could also be considered. But concrete could make space faster. It is a safer option and would avoid transboundary and trans uh, transboundary mm. pollution and dumping on other countries. That's what I think should happen. Okay, Mr. Curry, without having to go to court, what can be done before that? Well, the international law is very clear here. Japan has a number one obligation to carry out an environmental impact assessment. It hasn't done so. You will not find the word cumulative impacts addressed in the IAA study. Um, this is a 30-year process. You know, the impacts will accumulate. They will bioaccumulate in the environment. This hasn't been done, as well as the consultations haven't been carried out. That's the first thing Japan must do, okay. carry out a full public environmental impact assessment, and then it must implement the international legal requirements. Well, thank you very much. We have to leave it there. We have been talking to Professor Chi Ye from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, also Professor of the School of Public Policy and Management from Tsinghua University. Joining us from Guangzhou, Mr. Lake Barrett, former U.S. Uh, Department of Energy official senior and now senior advisor to TEPCO. Dr. Arjun Makijani, President of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, and Duncan Curry, an international law expert. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, and, you. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of uh, the live stream and this special edition of uh, uh, Headline Buster brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point. <laughs>